We're ready for a CCO Club webinar number 68. Yay, I'm seeing the names come in. We'll give them a few seconds as they come in. Excellent, I see some names that I recognize. Don't forget everyone that we're going to have a great topic tonight and our lucky people that are already in the CCO Club will be able to get a copy of this slide deck as well as the transcription in the video and be able to ask questions and create referencing this again and again uh, through the CCO Club. And you're, you're going to want to because there's some cool stuff that, that I've put in here. Tonight's topic is new risk adjustment jobs for medical coders. You know, we get questions about risk adjustment a lot. And this is uh, the beginning of the, the hiring craze, or maybe I should say hiring phase for risk adjustment. It's getting close to the end of the year, and so they've got to get their final pulls in, and so the MA plans are looking to hire. The recruiters have lots of risk adjustment jobs out there. Again, if you need CEUs, you can go to the CCO Club to do that, and you get the webinar support and the replays, like I mentioned before, where you'll be able to get this slide deck as well as the transcript that we are going to be talking about. Uh, it's really easy to find the CCO Club, guys. It's cco.us forward slash club. So let's jump right in. The first thing we're going to talk about is the different types of jobs. Now we're going to circle around and come back to a couple of these topics again at the bottom. Uh, but I want to talk to you about these six types of risk adjustment jobs because they are very, very different. And even within these jobs, there are different roles that you could possibly get. So. The first thing, the jobs. Let's start with an MA plan. What is an MA plan? The MA plan is the, the payer that has the contract with Medicare to collect the information, the statistics and the data. Right now there's different ones. Uh, I, in the past I had worked for Optum doing risk adjustment coding and it is uh, through UHC. Now, Blue Cross Blue Shield has one, Cigna has one. They all different ones have MA plans if they do risk adjust. And if they have, they take Medicare patients, then they have an MA plan. They also would have a, a for HHS, which is Health and Human Services. So don't think that an MA plan is just for Medicare patients, which are 65 uh, age is 65 years and older, or maybe they have uh, end-stage renal disease or other conditions that qualify them for Medicare. This could be uh, them capturing HHS as well, so it would be a complete capture. That's the verbiage they use. And that means they ultimately just capture all diagnoses. You know, there are risk adjustment codes that carry an HCC for CMS. That would be an MA plan that does Medicare. And then there would be risk adjustment jobs that collect for HHS, which would be a different setup of codes where they're not going to just be patient 65 and over. There'll be obstetric codes, you know, and they're not all just chronic conditions. And we're going to explain why that's different here in just a few minutes uh, on another slide, explaining kind of the background and what risk adjustment is. It's important to understand that also when you're trying to decide what job is going to be best for you or what you want to set your goals at. Next, let's go to payers. The MA plans are payers. The payers are the insurance companies. However, the MA plans are different than the regular payers. But not only do the MA plans hire risk adjustment coders, but the payers do as well. UHC has the MA plans that does risk adjustment, but they also are going to have people that are coding and educating for risk adjustment to their UHC patients and providers. Have you ever gone 
on Google or whatever search engine you, you use, and you're trying to come up with a, a, a some way to validate what you're trying to explain to somebody in the office and say, well, I know we're supposed to use this code because of this guideline. I looked at the guidelines, but it, there's kind of, you know, it's kind of ambiguous. And so I Googled it. I found that there was this Blue Cross Blue Shield article. And it's not so much as an article as kind of like a blog that they put out and send out to all of their different um, providers as education. And it explains in detail the guidelines, the codes, the surrounding information. It's almost like a cheat sheet on how to deal with pressure ulcers, you know, how to code it properly, what documentation to make. It's brilliant stuff. Well, who's making that? the people that work for the payers. They're the educators, but not just educators. They're the coders that go in and also do audits. That leads us into education. Now, of course, CCO, that's what we do. We do education. We do education for people that are just getting into this industry. We do education for people who have been coders or in medical billing or carry one of the credentials that we educate on for some time as well as after people have been out in the field, in the trenches, we also end up being subject matter experts where we have people that have questions in the office. Half the office wants to code it this way, the other side of the office wants to code it that way, and which is the right way, you know. Well, anybody can say that they have the right answer. However, <laughs> you gotta have something to cite your work, right? You've got to be able to have something to back it up. You can't be just like a parent that says, you know, code it this way because I say so. No, there has to be a reason. And these resources that the payers give out, that, that some coders, risk adjustment coders, and, and other type of coders are working with them, help make that education. But for us, there's education in you know, if you've been in the industry for over five years with a credential, then you can turn around and become an educator like what CCO does, right? And or work for a company like CCO and then educate specifically. Now, there are educators that work with all credentials as well as risk adjustment credential, the CRC, which is what we do. We're gonna talk about that in a minute as well. Let's go back to the other side, hospital systems. The uh, when I was in Missouri, one of the larger hospital systems was the one through the University of Missouri. So, of course, it was a teaching hospital. They had a med school and not only did they have education for providers, but they had clinicians. They had specialty uh, clinicians that you could get education for. You could become a nurse anesthetist. They had uh, M.A. Uh, schools, they had PA schools, they had, you know, just just the gamut. They had lots of medical schools associated to the university because it was a teaching hospital. And you'll find that in other cities where you have teaching hospitals. But that system also kind of filtered out into the smaller communities. So University of Missouri Medical um, I think the University of Missouri Medical Centers, you could go to Columbia where it was at and then the surrounding towns like Jefferson City that would have been 30 minutes away, Moberly, Missouri, even all the way, probably not all the way down into Springfield, but kind of a, a ge geographically within, you know, maybe a hundred miles radius, they would have little clinics set up that were part of the hospital system. But the hospital system itself hires risk adjustment coders. Now, when they first started doing this, I was in St. Louis and I was really surprised. I'm, I'm trying to think of how long ago that would have been. And um, we're, we're talking probably seven years, six years ago, I would suspect, I'm trying to recall. And I was doing a lecture for the St. Louis, one of the St. Louis local chapters. And uh, one of the ladies had said that she was worked for the hospital, which hospital it was, as a risk adjustment coder, and they had a team. And I think they had up to eight coders working and hired by the hospital to help the providers and 
to, to educate them, but also to uh, start coding the, the, the HCCs before they went out to the MA plans. And I thought, that's brilliant. That really is brilliant. So again, that is already out there. It's not just eight people for a large hospital system now. Now it's a whole coding department. That in turn opened up for the clinic systems. Now the hospital system and the clinic systems, even though they may be under the same major entity, they're two separate individuals when you look at them. So ultimately what it means is the hospital system has a budget and the clinic system has a budget. They're both say University of Missouri Health Systems, right? But this is the hospital and this is the clinic system and they have two separate budgets. So therefore, if you are a risk adjustment coder for the hospital, your pay comes from them. And if you are a risk adjustment coder for the clinic system, then your pay comes from their budget. And a lot of times these are quality uh, uh, QA jobs. They could also be CDI work, document specialty work, falls, the risk adjustment uh, coders would fall under that. But they will hire a lot depending on how many clinics they have. An example, Baylor Scott and White here in Texas where I'm at, they take up almost the entire part of Texas, but their largest areas are North Texas and Central Texas. And I'm not sure how many coders they have exactly for their clinic systems, uh, but I believe that the North has, you know, would have like 20 probably. And um, uh, I think that the Central has even more than that because they have more clinics. So they are doing just risk adjustment coding. That's not the other coders that are doing the standard coding that we're all used to. This is only risk adjustment coders prepping and getting things ready to go out to the that so that the documentation is secure when it gets to the MA plan. Then that leads us into provider education, which is one of the things that I love to do. Now, my position with them when I contract out for uh, another organization would be usually through the clinic system. So I could be doing audits. You can do audits of the clinic system risk adjustment coders, but a lot of the time you're uh, talking to the providers themselves, not just the providers, but the clinic administrators the clinic managers so that you can schedule time with those providers. You can make sure that if that particular clinic say has four doctors in it and they're struggling with a particular uh, area, say they aren't documenting obesity correctly and the clinic administrator has had auditing come in, maybe you're one of the ones that come in and audit for them and you say, okay, here are three codes that we see we're missing opportunities on. Okay, then the provider educator creates training for that, meets with the providers, trains them, and then has then it's available for ongoing education at the same time. So you could be training for one clinic with two doctors, four doctors, five doctors, 10 doctors. You could have multi-specialties in the clinic uh, as well, right? So it's pretty diverse in the clinic system, in the hospital system, and in the provider education. Let me go back to the MA plans. Let me tell you what differentiates the MA plans, the risk adjustment coders, to say the clinic system coders that do risk adjustment. And again, remember, we are talking about risk adjustment jobs. We are not talking about the general coders that are capturing the ENMs for each office visit and why that patient was seen there that day. Instead, we're capturing uh, codes that carry HCCs and making, making sure that, that it has meat. So the MA plan, if you're a coder for them, you probably, you can work anywhere. Uh, these jobs are all predominantly, probably not the payers per se, they could be at a specific location, but they all have the potential to be remote. And I, and now of course, almost everything is remote, but risk adjustment is notoriously known for being a remote job. So the MA plan, what's their role? They, 
the MA plan has the contracts with the providers and at, at three times a year, they're getting patient information. The documentation comes in and it's a year's worth of documentation for that patient. So Mr. Uh, uh, Frank Jones here is a 75 year old, you know, male that's from uh, New York City uh, in Queens. Okay. And he, it's all of the documentation every time he goes to see a provider for an entire year. That's all captured. It could be anywhere from 30 pages to 1,000 pages. And the MA risk adjustment coder is going to go through every single page. And they're going to pull out every face-to-face -face visit with an approved provider, the HCCs that can be captured for that patient. Then what they're going to do is on top of that, they're auditing, doing like CDI work for the documentation. There's other things that have to be done. You have to match the name. You have to match the uh, the the provider that is on that file. Uh, you have to make sure the signature is a valid electronic signature. Um, you know, you uh, there, there's a whole list of things that you're required to do that fall under like error or omis error and omissions before you even get to the coding part. Then you pull out and abstract all of your HCCs and then it's sent off to CMS. Now the difference for a clinic system risk adjustment coder, again that's for doctor's office. Let's say you're doing all of uh, northern Texas. All right, you have 30 clinics and you probably have 200 providers and you are coding for all of them. Now, again, you are only capturing HCCs. Diagnosis is the carry in HCC, but you have to make sure that it has meat, right? And then you're coding that out, usually on a spreadsheet, right? Uh, and then after that's all submitted, you're making sure everything looks nice so that when it goes to the MA plan, they won't have any problems. Those coders will be able to get those codes pulled out easily and your provider will uh, pass their audits and your provider will be reimbursed for the, the needs of the patient for the next year. So the clinic system is coding as you go but the MA plan is looking at the previous year, right? So that's just some of the really unique jobs that are available. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, jobs that are available. And I wanted to let you know about Max. If you have a pen and paper with you, you can write his information down. He is one of the recruiters with Addison Group, and they're a very reputable um, uh, recruiting agency uh, that's heavily involved in medicine. They hire a lot of coders. Now, they hire coders that are uh, involved in working for clinics, for hospitals, uh, specialists, specialist coders, maybe you're for cardiology, maybe you do anesthesiology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, however, right now, I talked to Max today, and he said there are a lot of jobs that just opened up for risk adjustment coders, and they're probably going to be more for MA plans, but uh, they're all remote. And the unique thing about doing risk adjustment is you're only dealing with one code set, ICD-10, CM. Unlike the other coders that are doing the in-the-moment day-to-day coding for why that patient was seen in that facility or that provider that day, they're dealing with multiple code sets, right? Your clinics are working with ICD-10. They're also working with CPT. They're doing HCPCS codes. They have to know all of that. And if you're working facility inpatient coding, then you're doing ICD 10 CM, ICD 10 uh, PCS, you're doing HICS fix codes as well. And if you're doing like ancillary surgery and, and so outpatient surgery, you're probably dealing with CPT codes as well, right? Uh, but with risk adjustment, one code set, then you have to know it well. I'm going to give you examples of why it's important to know those codes well. So feel free to reach out to Max, and uh, you see that his email address is max.dot 
I think it's Bruckner, B-R-U-C-K-N-E-R at addisongroup.com. And he's out of Houston, but he covers um, all of Texas, as far as I know. And uh, I believe they recruit for all over the United States. So make sure that you reach out to him. While that's there, let me just scan some of these questions, these fabulous questions that are coming in. Uh, uh, we're going to have questions at the end, but I want to make sure that, um, let's see. Amanda says, what would be a good place to start in the field if you only have a CRC credential? Should I get my CPCA right after this course before reaching, uh, searching out jobs? Amanda, don't wait. Start searching immediately as soon as you get your credential. Now, just the harsh truth is nobody is going to hire you without a credential, a credential. Uh, the CRC is a fabulous credential. If you have that credential, then you're qualified for the risk adjustment jobs. If you have your CPC and not the CRC, you're qualified to do risk adjustment jobs. However, every year the tide starts turning and they are looking for CRCs. So if you have the CPC and the CRC, that's going to carry a lot of weight in your favor, even if you're brand new with both credentials, depending on the job that you're getting. But they're willing to take a chance with you, you know, I'm sure. Uh, so I would go ahead and start applying for jobs right away, Amanda. Uh, reach out to Max, for example. Let him know, you know, or when you get your CRC uh, that, you know, you have, you're a new CRC. And then there will be jobs where they say, no, we don't want that. We want somebody with more experience. And then there'll be other jobs that say, nope, we're willing to take a chance. And you may only work with that organization for a month, you know, because that's all either all the time that they have for that contract or you just don't cut it. And that's fine because you get to put that on your resume and that builds up your experience points. And you always want to be constantly adding to your experience. So. I would, though, go ahead and get the CPC. It's going to open up doors for you that just having the one uh, CRC is really a niche credential. Even though there's lots of jobs out there, you, you, uh, you want to bra broaden that frame for yourself. Marnie says, has the pandemic affected the risk adjustment coding jobs prospects this year? It has changed them. Honestly, it has. Um, predominantly, all risk adjustment jobs are remote especially with the clinics uh, and the MA plans. However, uh, the with the MA plans, those patients are being seen and have a year's worth of documentation from the previous year. So it's not affecting them whatsoever. Next year it'll affect them, maybe, but they're always looking at the previous year. So they're they're golden. But the teams that are doing like clinic risk adjustments, yeah, they've kind of had to narrow them down uh, because not enough patients are being seen, right? But it's it's getting back to normal. Uh, let's see. Let me just move this down. Excuse me. Any advice to getting an entry-level RA coder position? And, ooh, Khadija? I, no, I am so sorry that I tortured your name. Uh, but what I would do is reach out to a recruiter. We've done a webinar previously on uh, recruiters and what they look for. Uh, check our YouTube channel for that and get some a little bit of insight. But you know, feel free to reach out to Max as a recruiter. He's going to tell you the and he'll be he'll be frank and honest and say this is this is what you need under your belt. And this is what people are looking for now. Uh, and he's been doing it long enough where he can say, you know, in two months, it could change completely. And we could have other things uh, open up. Uh, so, you know, I would check with them. They truly are the experts, the recruiters. They have the pulse of the jobs that are out there. They're paid to find employees. So, again, it's, it's uh, something that they're going to be able to offer advice. Also, I would uh, get involved with LinkedIn. That's a very good uh, area to get in to to know what is happening who's hiring so that first level job just check with the recruiters and in risk adjustment MA plans are probably going to hire faster than clinics 
Kathleen says, what's the definition of an MA plan? And uh, the MA plan stands, for, oh dear, I hope I don't embarrass myself. Let me think, it's uh, uh, Medicare Advantage is what it stands for. <laughs> I had to think for a second, oh, I can't remember. I've just called it MA for so long, Medicare Advantage plans. Yeah, and it says, Okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to go back to our slides here. Do you have any tips to increase productivity? Yep. I, yeah, in fact, we have done some videos on that. And okay, let's let's move on and then I'll come back to those. Okay. So everybody's had an opportunity to write down Max's information. You can send him an email and all they can do is say no, right? It's worth the worth the try. So what is risk adjustment? Some of you I know are out there saying, hey, I, I've heard about risk adjustment. I know they hire new coders, uh, but what, what is it? Why is it different? Now, you need to know this information because if you're going to go talk to Max or he sets you up in an interview and it's probably going to be remote, you know, digitally like this, some type of a, a virtual interview most likely, then you got you have to be able to tell them what your understanding of risk adjustment is and risk adjustment like we said if you're hiring for an ma plan what they want your knowledge base to be in regarding you know what a coder does and the long-term effect of what a coder does is different from say a clinic risk adjustment coder so let's let's look at what risk adjustment really, really is. And this is some of the verbiage that you're going to be able to use in your interview. So it's very important. What does HCC stand for? They may or may not ask you this uh, because everybody just uses the word HCC. But let me tell you something real quick. Make, to, to show that you are an authority, that you have confidence, don't call it an HCC job even if they do. This is risk adjustment. You are a risk adjustment coder that deals in HCCs, okay? So what does HCC stand for? Hierarchical condition category. What does a risk adjustment coder do? They abstract diagnoses that carry an HCC so that they can be collected for statistical purposes and, and payment. Uh, chronic conditions are what CMS captures. Not all diagnoses carry an HCC. Now, if you use an encoder, that it wasn't like this in the past, but now several of the encoders have the HCC information in there. Uh, find a code is one of them, and uh, one of the reasons I absolutely love Find a Code. They're first ones to put the HCCs in with the codes. And not only with CMS, but also HHS. So if you understand the way payers work, CMS is Medicare, HHS is Medicaid. However, they're federally funded. Now, HHS is state funded, it's Medicaid, but they also get federal funds for the state. So the government is interested in making sure there's a balanced budget there. But now, the federal government also backs commercial insurances, right? That's what happened when Obamacare went into effect. And since that's the case, they have a vetted interest in making sure that it the budget works out. And that's what risk adjustment does. You take you're planning the risk that is uh, you're taking in treating these patients. So that's very important. Now, in HCCs, they're assigned a weight, and that weight, you look in the green box right under it, the patients start out with a RAF score of 1, but different diagnoses carry an HCC weight. For example, a patient that has diabetes will carry a weight of 19, okay? That's the HCC 19, and then it will have a, a weight, and, and I don't remember what it is, but we'll say 0 0.015, okay? And a patient that has brain cancer would be a 
0.05, okay? Now, that's just like a number on a, a, a ruler, you know, so we know that it's going to cost more money to take care of the cancer patient than it would be for the diabetic patient. Now, we're going to take all of those diagnoses and add them together. And that ends up being, after you do a few more equations, the RAF score. I'll show you an example of that here in the future. The RAF score is recalculated every year. Now, this is important if you're going to be a risk adjustment coder because this tells how long you'll be working. Why does the MA plans hire heavily closer to the end of the year? Because they only have till the end of the year to capture the HCCs and get the RAF score before January 1st when the slate's wiped clean and that patient no longer has any HCCs or diagnoses. You start over. So January 1st, guess what? Not much of a need for a risk adjustment coder for an MA plan on January 1st because we got all year to capture their HCCs. And uh, so again, you ramp up close to the middle to the end of the year, often MA plan risk adjustment coders were laid off for November and December. Now you think, oh, wow, I don't want a job where I get laid off in November and December. Well, before November and December, you're working so hard to get the contract complete of like 3,000 cases that come in in a day that you're not coding all three, your team is, uh, that they're allowing you to work overtime. You know, they don't care how many hours you get in as long as we get these cases in and out the door. And it's quality versus quantity with them. So it, you also have to have a very high accuracy rate. You're constantly audited. Okay, so that RAF score ramps up uh, to be captured and then in, it's all done. They, they're, it's like they're contracted to have it all in by November. So they don't need their coders anymore. So they let the coders go until they get ready for the next pull, which is nah, January, start February, you know, they start hiring you back. But if you know ahead of time, you can plan for that. Uh, some people don't get laid off. They just move you to different uh, contracts and stuff. So if you're good, they keep you. They want to keep you. Notice here the average RAF score is one. Most people, you know, if you have less than a one, uh, then it means that you're a healthy your patient. If you have more than a one, then you're a sicker patient. And we need to set more money aside for that patient. Uh, CMS uses the RAF score to determine the need for additional reimbursement for a sicker patient. So again, your cancer patient and your diabetic patient, two different RAF scores, right? And how much money do we need to set aside for the cancer patient? A whole lot money, much a whole lot more money next year than this than than um, this patient. Okay, and I always make up a number. So like, okay, we got to set aside fifty thousand dollars for the cancer patient, brain cancer, and we're only setting aside ten thousand dollars for the diabetic patient for the next year. And if those RAF scores aren't captured actu accurately that money's net not set aside and you still got to pay to treat that patient so why is it important here's a little more information that's going to help you with your interviews so uh, some HCC reminders that when you're pulling the HCCs from the documentation it has to be from a face-to-face -face CMS approved provider now they're doing video it can be a video, it cannot be a telephone, but that's only new because of the pandemic. It has to be documented, it has to carry meat, which we'll talk about, and it has to be billed. It has to show that it was billed. Now, that's for the clinic uh, providers. The uh, RA plans, they don't care that it's been billed for them. At the end of the year, you, you gotta capture everything at least once a year, and at the end of the year, it's done. So therefore, if you have a diabetic patient with a BKA on January 1st of the next year, his leg grew back as far as CMS is concerned until you capture an HCC stating that he's a BKA. Starts over.
Now that doesn't happen with your regular coders that are doing the, the other work. Uh, so not only do you have to be very careful with the diagnoses, you have to be very good about capturing the meat. Now the providers need to be educated to where your education uh, provider educators come in on how to make sure that the meat is being documented as well. And it's pretty easy. It's showing that you're monitoring, you're evaluating, you're assessing it, you're treating that particular diagnosis. So with your diabetic patient, they're on insulin. You see it in the med list. He refilled the insulin. They're getting their A H1C checked. Uh, for your cancer patient, they're uh, continuing uh, radio uh, uh, radiation with the radiologist or radiation treatment with the oncology radiologist. You know, that's your meat. Uh, so if you have an increase of the number of HCCs and uh, the diagnosis reported appropriately, then that increases the RAF score and then that increases the reimbursement from CMS. Let's talk about the skills. And this is also something you're going to need to talk about in your interview. It's all about the one code set, diagnoses. When you look at the diagnoses, you also need to know the signs and symptoms. You need to know the medications that are treated because, again, that's part of the meat. If you don't know what medication is used to treat hypertension, then how are you going to draw that line, right? Uh, they want to know that you're familiar with the disease process. What is the common treatment for a patient that has uh, polyneuropathy? Well, they're probably on a medication of gamma pentin, right? Uh, maybe they go to the neurology department to have an evaluation done for that pain because it's actually a nerve pain, a neurological pain of the peripheral nervous system. So you need to know that that's what that is, right? You need to be able to, to do that length. Some very common and basic areas that risk adjust are going to be all of your diabetes codes. So that's E8 through E13. Of course, E10 and E11 are the main type 1, type 2 diabetes. But don't forget, there's E8, there's also E13. So you have to know those. You have to remember long term insulin use that risk adjusts. There's manifestations for diabetes. Most all diabetics have some type of manifestation. Is it renal manifestation? Is it the eyes, ophthalmic? Is it um, uh, nervous system? Those are just a few. Uh, we also have heart failure, the I50 codes. We have the cardiomyopathy, I42, they risk adjust. Pathological fractures risk adjust. Other fractures do not. Uh, enteritis, ulcerative colitis, the K codes, only those codes, K50 through K51. There's some malnutrition codes, things like that, but predominant, there's not a whole lot of K codes that risk adjust. Uh, late effects of a stroke, the sequelas, the I69, a few of those, and uh, cancers, malignant cancers, not cancers in situ or uh, benign. They don't. But this that's just a little window, right? There's over 10,000 codes that risk adjust. Remember I told you that I was going to show you why this makes a difference? Uh, one of the other provider educators that I've been working with, Nareda, she created this and it's brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. So I want to thank her uh, for this. But let's say you're doing a risk, your risk adjustment coding and your patient comes in at, at 71 years old, female, they automatically have a risk score of 0.386. Um, they have a cough that doesn't risk adjust. So by the time you work out the denominator, the PM and PM, in which, you know, unless you're on the financial side of risk adjustment, which is another opportunity for you, um, then that's not going to pay. Uh, you, you don't worry about that. Don't, if you're not a numbers person, don't let that freak you out. Ultimately, $3,705.60 will be set aside for the next year for this patient. The problem is, is that it, uh, that, that really wasn't the highest specificity. The patient also had angina. Well, that carries, uh, you know, an HCC of 88. And they had COPD. They had an ulcer on their calf. And they had that cough. 
Okay, so now we add up those HCCs that carry a score, and we have a score of 1.371. So when you do the math aspect, it went from, from 3,705 to $13,161.60. But actually, that wasn't everything, and it wasn't to the highest specificity. Okay, so from what the provider is documented, or maybe the wrong uh, diagnoses were being captured. So this is what was actually happening with the patient. And you can see how it re reflected in the amount of money that's being set aside for that patient. So of course, we have our 71-year-old female. Not only do they have angina, which risk adjusts, but look at the difference in the weight of a patient that has a not unspecified angina that one uh, 0.135, they have unstable angina. Well, that has an HCC of 87 and carries a 0.195. Think, oh, well, that's not much. Well, yeah, it adds up. It's 50 points different. COPD, again, that stays the same, but they don't just have an ulcer on their calf. They have atherosclerosis with an ulcer. That's a 160 and goes from a 0 0.515 to a 1.4888. Okay, that's a huge jump. Then we have the ulcer that you get to code for. And then the patient has CHF. And they have a disease interaction, which is a new little tweak that they started doing with ulcers and dementia. So they get this like little bonus um, addition to the score. Then they have the cough. But let's say, let's add some, let's add another tweak in there. What if it wasn't a cough? It was actually a smoker's cough. Smoker's cough risk adjustment, but a cough won't. So that would have made a change, right? So they have actually five chronic conditions. They get a little tweak for that. And their score went from the zero 0.386 to the 3.447, which in turn means CMS is setting aside and paying that provider, not just setting aside money, paying the provider the next year $33,000 and $33,091.20. So what do you want your provider to be paid? What does the provider want to be paid? $3,705 next year for Miss Nelly, Liz Caller, or $33,000. And again, it's going to cost $33,000 to treat that patient because they actually have all of these diagnoses, not just a cough. So again, this is what the risk adjustment coder does, both for the RA plan, the MA plan, but also the clinic system and the hospital coders and the provider educators. The provider educators are making sure that really good top-notch documentation is being done for the patient so that we can see that it's unstable angina, not just angina, unspecified. And then we're also making sure that the coders are really savvy, the risk adjustment coders, and they're capturing the unstable angina, not the code for angina to make the difference. So it's really a big team and you can be a member of any part of that team. I love this slide. Rita did such a good job. Uh, another thing about documentation and having to make sure that you can draw a line. What if you have documentation like this where you have an HPI and the provider says there's no diabetic complications but then when you go down and look at the diagnosis and the, the assessment and the plan, it says, oh, we have a di two diabetic patient with diabetic polyneuropathy. And they code it E11.42. Well, and they're gonna, and they're on gamma pentin. That's, you know, that's all meat. The problem is the HPI says no diabetic complication. So when the CMS auditor comes in and looks at this and they get paid to make mistakes, they're gonna say, well, that doesn't work. That's contradictory. And if the provider documented that, then he's probably making other mistakes. Let's go see where those other mistakes are. So again, part of the risk adjustment uh, job is to help audit and make sure all this information is uh, smooth. Some areas, they're often missed. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide because there is a lot of questions going on here and I want to get to them. But these are codes that risk adjustment coders have to be very aware of. Now, 
if you have a patient that has, oh, let's see, their status post bone marrow transplant, and they come and see the doctor, if that code is left off, that Z code is left off, Z94.81, it's going to make a difference in, you know, the regular uh, uh, visit. Not probably as much, but a risk adjustment patient, absolutely. A risk adjustment coder is going to jump all over that. That carries weight. And we saw the difference, right? from $3,000 to $33,000 difference. And these are the common codes that are overlooked and not captured. So if you want to have a risk adjustment job, you've got to be really savvy with these codes. And that also means that when you step in for that interview, it would be appropriate for you to say that uh, you've worked hard to bring up your skill set so that you don't miss opportunities to capture HCCs from common things like ostomies or artificial openings, paralytic syndromes, obesity, uh, transplant uh, statuses, things like that. If you throw that verbiage in there, then they know you know what you're talking about. You're coming in with confidence and authority. And then you need to make sure that you can follow up with that, that you are able to, to capture this stuff. Now let's talk about the credential real quick. The CRC credential, you can get this information straight from the AAPC website. I copied it from them. And uh, again, it's right there open to anybody, whether you're a member or not, uh, the information about the credential itself. Uh, also, they always make a point on all of their credentials to say certified coders earn 40% more than non-credentialed coders. But the fact is, is you're not going to get hired unless you're credentialed. And the CRC is the risk adjustment credential. Uh, in the past, you didn't have to have it. It was a new credential. But now it's been out long enough that um, they're going to ask you, the recruiters and the employers are going to say, do you have your CRC? And if you don't, then the proper verbiage would be to, no, I do not have it at this time. I'm a CCS or a, a CPC or whatever credential you have, but I am going to actively get the risk adjustment credential because I know it will benefit my career, blah, 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 right? Okay, so uh, again, you can just jump out and look at that. The reason I wanted you to see this aspect of what's on the uh, AAPC website is it tells you kind of an average of what the risk adjustment coders make. And I would say that it goes from $19 an hour and up, okay? Uh, depending on if you're new, it's going to be $19 an hour. Uh, I don't know how much they call in the clinics, but the MA plans uh, probably wouldn't be less than $19 an hour. Uh, that's with or without the credential. And I would assume they're paying more if you have the CRC credential. You have to have at least this, the stand, a, a standard credential. And then notice, as a CRC, you will be able to. All of these bullets, I'm not going to go over them because they're on the website. You can go look at the website. Or if you're in the club, you can look at these as well. But it's mostly information that we have already gone over. Now, when you see the bullet that says, understand the audit process for risk adjustment models, when we were talking about the RAF score, that's the risk adjustment model. Okay. Anytime you have any question about verbiage, you shoot it out to the club and let us know. I'm more than happy to answer that and find resources uh, and let you know what verbiage is if you don't already understand. But if you're taking our course, you'll, you'll have that. All that information is part of the course. So the credential, uh, what do they test you on? Again, straight from the website, uh, diagnosis coding, the one code set, uh, documentation improvement, because again, you're auditing, and documentation improvement is going to be things like seeing the no uh, diabetic complications and then a patient that's uh, coded at E11.4 something, big red flag. Uh, patholo uh, patholo pathophysiology, medical terminology, and anatomy. Now, our course 
goes over that but we have in addition a pathophysiology course separate as that you can get we also have a uh, medical terminology and anatomy and I think that to be really good at risk adjustment, you have to understand the medications. And we have a pharmacology course that you can take. Purpose and use of the risk adjustment model, which I've already kind of explained a little bit to you. And if you are a CRC, you will have been tested on this, so you'll know it. Quality care and risk adjustment models. Those are the divisions of the test. Uh, it is also a five hour and 40 minute exam, like the other exams cost and everything is the same. So let me tell you real quick about what we offer in our course. Uh, again, we break down all of the extra stuff that is just fluff. We get straight to the meat of, and meat is a big thing to say in risk adjustment, that you need for the risk adjustment credential, the CRC, to pass that. But really it's open to anybody it could be a new career as you saw one of our people uh who was it that said that they were a uh, they were getting their crc should they get the cpc also yeah absolutely it would you know i would think you would want to do that uh, so you can either go straight for the crc and uh, later pick up other credentials or you can get the cpc and then set for the crc it'll make you more well-rounded to have both uh, healthcare workers, a lot of uh, clinicians, nurses really do well in risk adjustment because they understand and read the documentation so much. But anybody that works in the health food, uh, health field is going to have their foot already in the door because they understand the process that's done uh, that affects the patient. They just have seen the behind the scenes. So again, the jobs with Max. Let me look at some of these questions that have come in because I think, yep, let's do questions. So I'm gonna leave Max's information up when we answer the rest of these questions. It's been, I'm sorry, very difficult to get all of the information that I wanted to get you uh, in a area that I'm very passionate about and I absolutely love down to one hour. <laughs> <laughs> so know that you can reach out in the club. I'm there uh, to answer your questions. We have other risk adjustment coders and people in there from different areas uh, that can answer your questions. Let me just look up here just a minute. Okay. Marnie says, do you have any tips to increase productivity in RA coding? Yes, understand the different EMRs and what they look like if you have access to be able to look at those. If you don't, that's okay because if you work for an MA plan, you're gonna be looking at every single EMR that's out there. If you work for a clinic system, it's whatever EMR they use. They use Epic or whatever, whatever one. Uh, and so that'll be repetitious. You'll pick it up very, very quickly. The other thing is, like I mentioned before, medical terminology and anatomy, pathophysiology, and pharmacology. Those three things increase your knowledge base and you will be faster. It just happens. If you got that under your belt, you will be much faster. Are there jobs for new coders without experience? Cindy says, yes, there are. And Max told me today that, again, they're hiring right now for risk adjustment coders. So uh, the MA plans, I think one year, and I don't know if it was a record or not, but we were all talking about it, uh, often uh, hired a thousand, a thousand brand and they uh, CPCAs. Not all of them were CPCAs, but they were hiring CPCAs. This had been unheard of in the past. And it was a turning point, I think. Uh, I'm trying to remember if that was like 2016 or so. Maybe it was before that. It was amazing that they were doing that. And again, they may hire a thousand, and in six weeks, it may be down to 800, you know, because they let them go. They didn't cut, cut it. Then, you know, in um, two months, it's you know, uh, two more months, it's down to 500. And then it's down, you know, it goes down as you go along, because they're taking a chance, they're willing to put you in the training, and see if you can cut it. All right. And if you don't, they let you go. 
and don't ever think that's bad because you got free training. It's amazing. You know, but you're audited constantly. You have to have a positive attitude, be willing to learn. And if you can do that, you will go much farther. I think from all the people that were hired, and I can't remember the total now. I used to tell everybody how much it was. But when I started working for Optum, however many people were hired and say there was like 200 that were logging into the training when we started. And then there was like 60. Uh, uh, by the end of the training and at the end when they were letting people go there were like 12 of us left out of all of those people there were 12 that were still doing it Kimberly says can you provide that email address on max yep there you go good thinking for me right uh, Heather says what about the COC absolutely to me in my opinion the CPC and the COC are kind of interchangeable so yeah absolutely if you've got the COC go for it uh, Anne says is risk adjustment something that a new coder uh, with no actual work experience can do Anne Marie try all they can do is say no if you can pass the entry exam and another tip learn um, uh, Excel you work quite a bit with Excel in fact I had to take an Excel exam before I worked for Optum that was one of the prerequisites uh, so learn Excel you can go to YouTube if you don't know it very well and it's just the basics but take a risk adjustment coding um, take a test we have a free exam on the website so go to the cco.us go to freebies take that exam the CRC practice exam if you can pass that then and you can pass the ICD 10 exam that we offer then I bet you can pass whatever exam they're going to throw at you if you can do that Anne Marie then they'll hire you should I pursue a CRC even though I have my CPC Vicki absolutely you should do that if if risk adjustment is an area that you're interested in and it it just every couple of years it just doubles the jobs i mean it's it's really going to take over some of the other jobs in my opinion i said back 8 years ago that risk adjustment was where it was at and now we're getting to this area where they're hiring cpcas i mean how crazy is that so yes you could still get the job, but I would get the CRC because it's going to come a time when the market is going to say, hey, you know what? We want CRCs now. And so I would just get it early. And plus, it's a great credential to have. It's fun. Cindy says, do you have to live in a specific state for a remote job? Absolutely not. You do not. I worked, uh, I was in Texas. And I also uh, lived in Missouri working for Optum, and Optum's out of Tennessee. So, nope. Uh, now, even if you're working for clinic systems, uh, even though you might be working remote, they're going to want you to come in to meetings and things. So, MA plans, no. A lot of remote jobs, no. But, you know, for a hospital or a clinic system, yeah, probably they're going to want you to be local to a point. And let's see, Allison, there's his number again. I have the, uh, Patricia says, I have the CPC, the COC, and CRC. Just got it in 2019, December, because I've no actual experience in risk adjustment. Nobody will hire me. We'll call Max. Patricia, give it a try. And again, you you could have all, you could have a dozen credentials, but if you can't pass an entrance exam, it's not going to do you any good. So go take our practice exam, both the ICD-10 and the CRC uh, practice exam. And again, they're going to more likely give you an exam like our ICD-10 exam. Uh, the MA plans don't really care if you understand the, the whole model and how RAF scores work. You won't be dealing with that. You are an abstractor. Um, your sli these slides, Anne-Marie, will be up, give them about 24, 48 hours before they hit the club. I'm not sure that ischemic cardiomyopathy is an HCC. Uh, it may have an RX HCC. And I'll go double check. Thanks. And oh, there's that French guy again. Yves, Yves. I remember from the other night. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself and not have your name recognized <laughs> now because you've got that exotic French name. Um, we'll double check. We'll double check. But it probably has an RXHCC. 
Uh, let's see, Alicia Fredericks. What current book do you recommend for uh, recommend for thorough disease process explanations from etiology through manifestations to resolution? You know what? Our uh, our pathophysiology book that's up on the cco.us website. Just go to um, courses and then go to pathophysiology and see the book there. It's fabulous. It probably would be one I would recommend, but by far the best risk adjustment book out there is Sherry Poe Bernard's risk adjustment uh, book. We use that as our textbook. I know Baylor Scott and White gives it to all of their coders. Uh, it's brilliant. And I would say that is the leading book to get. And it is on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, I think the AMA published that for her. Kathleen, is it possible or worthwhile to switch to HCC coding after doing inpatient coding? Inpatient coding pays really, really well uh, be, for several reasons. However, uh, I would check. If you're an inpatient coder and then you want to get into risk adjustment, maybe because you want to work remote, uh, it could be. Uh, and plus, you would be an experienced coder, so your pay would probably go up. I would just check. I would just check. I couldn't tell you with confidence, not knowing the the uh, geographics of where you were and stuff like that. But you can absolutely ask Max, and he will be blunt and frank with you and tell you, you know, what it pays. And some some uh, jobs may pay out better than others. The CCS credential, uh, Kathleen, is the inpatient credential through AHIMA. Very good credential. For how long? For how long in? absence of DMS criteria symptoms, can the HCC coder keep reporting code for drug dependence remission? One, two, three years, or is there a time limit? I don't know that answer off the top of my head. I was just doing a, uh, working on a presentation that had that in it today, but um, I don't know. So if in the club, just ask. If you ask that, I'll go pull that information. I'll try to get that uh, a copy of that to you. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, Bess. Natasha says, thanks for the information. You're welcome, Natasha. This is so much fun. And you know, CCO loves pumping this out to you. Uh, Kathy, starting salary for HCC positions, I would, I would say probably $19 an hour. It's pretty average. And all right. Uh, Audrey Aubrey says, thank you so much uh, for the rest of the CCO team for putting this webinar together. Very grateful for, for all that you do. I have have used CCO resources to successfully earn my AAPC credentials. Aubrey, thank you. You know what? That makes our day. We love hearing um, that we were helpful and you let us know what we can do to also uh, improve. You know, we, we want to know. Let's see. I think, oh, I hit that. Let me go down to the bottom and work my way up because we're we're at 8.02 for my time. And so I see lots of thank yous. And uh, Robin says, what's a typical productivity standard in a day? Risk adjustment in the MA plan would be 5.5 uh, uh, an hour. And so that would be patience. So it doesn't matter if you care you pull a, a patient that has 30 or 600 or a thousand pages because if they have a thousand pages most of that's fodder you can't code from that anyway you may only be able to code from 12 pages in that thousand but you have to go through all of them um, and sometimes those 30 page encounters uh, are or patients are much more intense and you really have to look for stuff so um, uh, but 5.5 is the accurate is uh, for MA plans, and I would say, uh, and it's 98 99 percent accuracy for audits. So you'll constantly be audited. You got to embrace that and have a positive attitude. For uh, clinic coders, I would say um, that's a lot different. You're looking at individual encounters, one encounter at a time, more or less, and uh, uh, that is more like 15 an hour, depending. Uh, not everybody gets up to 15, but 15 is, is average, 15 an hour. And so, again, 
you know, so, uh, if you're pumping out 30 an hour or you're doing, you know, something, something's off, uh, you, you may not be getting a very, and it's quality versus quantity. Okay, I see lots of things used. Uh, the author of that book, Jessica, was Sherry, it's S-H-E-R-I, Poe, P-O-E, Bernard, and it's on Amazon. And if you just put in Sherry Poe or you put in, you know, Sherry Risk Adjustment Book, uh, you'll it'll come up for you. And plus, it's the book we use. So go to the cco.us website, go to our CRC course, and it'll say what books you need. And it's in there. It even has a link to Amazon. So it can't get much easier than that. All right. I think that's it. I'm pretty sure. That it, it's an amazing book. I mean, I, I don't I can't tell you how many times I reference it several times a week. It's under my desk right now, uh, not at my feet, but under the little table, so I can just pull it out whenever I need it. It's a really good book. All right, guys. Well, then, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Remember, again, I keep saying it, uh, CCO Club. So go to cco.us forward slash club. All this content will be in there for you, as well as all kinds of bonus. And we're at your fingertips to answer questions all the time for you. Other subject matter experts are in there as well. I appreciate it. Also, you guys, if this was helpful, share. Because we don't advertise. And... Um, you know, we, we try to pump out as much free content as possible, as you'll see if you go look at our freebies, the free exams that we, we offer and uh, free webinars and things. But we do have children to feed. So, you know, if this was helpful, share with your colleagues, your peers, uh, share on the different social media platforms, LinkedIn and things like that. Let them know that we're here. All right. Bye, guys. Have a great rest of your evening.